Hello, my AV Calculus BC friends out there. Let's take a look at video number four now from topic 6.13. We're still talking about improper integrals, but this time improper integrals meets Mr. L'Hopital. So we're going to take a look at a slightly more complex problem that's going to require L'Hopital's rule, it looks like. But we're also going to be stretching our ability to integrate something a little bit more complicated. So I think you're going to like this one. So the problem looks a little bit like this. It says use L'Hopital's rule with an improper integral, and we're going to evaluate this pretty messy looking thing. And first and foremost, we recognize this as an improper integral because we have the infinite upper boundary. So if you remember, one of the very first things that you have to do, and you would earn a point for on a free response question, is to rewrite this with limit notation. So nothing new. I'm going to do the exact same thing that I've been doing throughout my video series on this topic, using b in place of the infinity and writing that limit statement out in front. Now, at this point, you have to start thinking a little bit more intently about how you want to go about integrating this. Because of the four examples that we've shared together so far, this is definitely the most complex. We need to recognize the technique that we need to use to integrate. And that technique is going to be integration by parts. Now, how do I know that? That's a great question. Well, if you look at this integrand, it's pretty clear that it consists of two components. And these two components, I don't know how to spell integration, guys. These two components are certainly being multiplied together. You have a 1 minus x, and then you have an e to the negative x. And in between, you see a multiplication, at least an invisible multiplication. So that's a good indicator that you use integration by parts. Now, it's also very possible if you wanted to distribute the e to the negative x in, but that's not going to bypass the need to use integration by parts because you would still have this x and this e to the negative x being multiplied together. I'm going to go ahead and choose to leave these two separate. And in my setup, I'm going to let my u be, well, let me think here. Um, I really could go with maybe either option, but how about I go with the 1 minus x as my u, and then I'll let my dv be the e to the negative x. Okay, so I differentiate by going down. So my du would be negative 1, right? swing over my dx, so it's negative 1 times dx. And then if my dv was e to the negative x, probably should have put the dx with it to complete this. And if I integrate e to the negative x, I get negative e to the negative x. In fact, we actually had to integrate this not too long ago in one of our previous problems. So if you recall, integration by parts is going to be uh, set up so that we take our u times our v and subtract the integration of v times du. If it's been a while since you've used integration by parts, I encourage you to kind of look back. Maybe you have notes on that that you can consult to remind yourself. So the limit's going to stay as it is being very patient. And then as I said before, we're going to have u multiplied by v. Um, I'll go ahead and just say 1 minus x times negative e to the negative x for right now. And then I'll subtract the integration of v times du. Well, what's going to happen with v times du is those two negatives are going to cancel, but that's going to leave this negative hanging around. And I have an e to the negative x there. And I know that what I've got going here is probably not really nice from a notation standpoint, and I, I get that. I probably should have still put a such that symbol here, and, and I could. I mean, I can go back and do that now if I want. I can put the B up here, and I can put the 1 down here. Here, um, after that minus, I can have this integral still go from B to 1. But if you felt like you wanted to just abandon those those boundaries and then reintroduce them later, 
I don't think it's a bad idea. You just got to remember to reintroduce them later. But I would strongly urge you to not link these two pieces together with an equal sign if you chose to not put boundaries, because that can be a, a bit of a problem sometimes on the AP exam when you set two things equal to each other that clearly aren't. All right. So from here, what do we do? Well, I'm going to go ahead and drop down this limit statement. And then I am going to officially rewrite this statement. We have 1 minus x times negative e to the negative x. And then if we integrate e to the negative x, which we've already done once in this problem, we get this negative e to the negative x. But that minus there is going to absorb that other minus into a plus, And therefore, we have something that looks like this. Now, all systems are go. We're just about there. We're ready to use our b and our 1. We're ready to plug those in, use the fundamental theorem, and then see what the limit looks like. So let's kind of put a little divider here so I can work in a second column. And the limit statement is going to drop in one more time here. And we're going to go ahead and plug in b for all of our x's. So. Well, I guess what would I have here? I would have 1 minus x, um, or I'm sorry, 1 minus b, that is. And then I would have that multiplied by negative e to the negative b. And then I would have an addition of e to the negative b. And then I would subtract a quantity. And now I'm going to plug 1 in for all of these x's. Well, I want to look really quickly at this first part, 1 minus x, 1 minus 1. Well, that's going to wipe out this entire first term. So I really don't see much need to write anything for the initial part. So all I need to follow up with is this e to the negative 1 power there. And I'd say that I have everything that I need after plugging in 1. Now the question is, how do we plug in our infinity for b? How do we really take this limit? There's a variety of ways that you can do this, but I'm going to have us do one more step of simplification here if you don't mind. I think it's going to make this just a little bit easier to work with. So what do I mean? Well, let's go ahead and distribute negative e to the negative b, and that would give us negative e to the negative b when you multiply that by 1. And then when we multiply that by negative b, I get a positive b times e to the negative b. Then I follow that up with a plus e to the negative b. And then lastly, with a minus e to the negative 1. Now, the wonderful benefit of doing that is that we should see a pair of terms that will cancel away. So that's certainly less that you have to work with in finding your limit. And then all that's left is this b times e to the negative b minus e to the negative 1. Now, taking the limit of b times e to the negative b is a little tricky because we can't just immediately insert infinity in for b because what we're really going to get is an infinity divided by infinity result. That's what we call what indeterminate. Now, to make that a little bit more clear, let's switch back to blue here. If I rewrite the negative exponents in this expression, as their nice denominator counterparts, then you'd have b over e to the b. And then why not? Let's do the same thing with this 1 over e constant. And like I said, it's a lot clearer to see that you have an infinity over an infinity. So what that means is you would use L'Hopital's rule. Hopefully we remember L'Hopital's rule. It's a concept that uh, was probably taught a while back because it is an AB topic. Um, it's way back in actually unit five of the AP calculus CED. So what L'Hopital's rule is saying is that if we have that indeterminate form, we can go ahead and take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom and then try to take that limit. Now, normally, if you have a L'Hopital's rule problem on the AP exam, you have to be really precise. You have to say things like, well, can L'Hopital's rule even apply? Well, to, to say that it applies, you might have to do something like this. The limit of the numerator as 
B approaches infinity is something that's also going to result in an infinite value. And then maybe the limit as B approaches infinity of the denominator, E to the B, is going to be approaching another infinite value. And therefore, we have an indeterminate form, and thus L'Hopital's can be used. You want to check with your teacher to, de to determine if that's something that you really need to be doing at this course, uh, at this part of your course. However, I, I would point out on the AP exam when questions like to kind of build in a lot of different concepts, it's probably likely that you'd want to be this specific. Show those two separate limits are going to produce an indeterminate form. Do it separately like I did, and then you're probably on track to, to score another point for your L'Hopital's rule setup. So in any event, we are going to go ahead and make that happen, and the limit as b approaches infinity would now be working upon the derivative of b is 1. The derivative of e to the b is e to the b. Please note that I am taking those derivatives with respect to b, the only variable that I have here. And then, of course, the 1 over e is just a constant, so it's not going to really change. And then, as we saw in a previous problem, this e to the b is going to become really big when b becomes infinity, and that's going to force 1 over something really big to become something really small, so close to zero that we're going to consider it to be zero and thus our answer is going to be zero minus one over e and lo and behold negative one over e is going to be the answer to our indefinite integral let's take a look and see what the calculator says about this answer well, as you can see, I've taken the liberty of entering this problem into my TI Inspire, and lo and behold, it does give us the same answer that we were able to achieve on paper, negative 1 over e. If you want to take a look graphically at what's happening, one thing that's important to note is that we did get this negative result for what would be construed as the area between the curve and the x-axis. And lo and behold, if you do graph this and look at from 1 to infinity, we seem to have some space that's all below the x-axis. So I like the fact that we got a negative result. It's verified graphically. And again, I know that we have this infinite amount of space, this really tiny crevice of space always being added to our cumulative total as we move towards infinity, but apparently that space that we're adding is so infinitesimally small that we're allowed to get this finite answer. So therefore, we have this answer of negative 1 over e. Now, I spoke about this in a previous video, but I want to hit it up one more time. While it's perfectly acceptable to say the answer is negative 1 over e, you can also say that we converge to negative 1 over e. In fact, it's probably a slightly better way to present the answer uh, for reasons that we've already talked about, but mainly those reasons are uh, the fact that we are always on our journey to become negative 1 over e in this sort of perpetual uh, accumulation of area kind of problem. So this is probably a slightly better way to present it. Anyhow, I, I hope that you're picking up a lot of uh, tips and tricks on how to involve or how to solve some of these improper integrals. Um, I've got a very interesting problem uh, to share with you that's going to involve having boundaries of both infinity and negative infinity in our next video. Hopefully you can stick around. We'll see you soon.